Thanks, Ned. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome along to today's webinar, Working More Productively From Home. So I'm Jeff Pryor, and I've worked with many of you over the last few years, but for those who don't know me, for nearly 20 years, I've been helping people and teams in organisations around Australia develop practical strategies and tools for being more productive. And I've had a particular focus within local government for most of that time. So clearly the world is a different uh, place than it was the last time I was working with you at Mornington. In fact, as I was preparing for this session, I looked back and realised that the last time I worked with you was in fact the last time I was in Melbourne. So I drove back to Wodonga where I live and I haven't been back to Melbourne for work since then, which is quite incredible really because I, I spent a lot of time on the road and I've travelled to Melbourne almost every week for more than 10 years. So in any case, most of us realise working from home will be here to stay for the foreseeable future at least. And working from home offers you obviously a, an incredible degree of flexibility. You can work around appointments, around children, around partners, which is generally a good thing, of course. But it also has its challenges, as I'm sure you're well aware of. In fact, I've had a home office for more than 15 years, two in fact, one home here in Wodonga, and my Melbourne um, unit or office, which I've had for the for the past five or so years. So I'm aware of the challenges that we all face. And of course, everyone's situation is quite unique. So it's, it, it's hard to be too prescriptive, but I wanna share some strategies and tools that I think can help you be more productive when working from home. So I'm gonna launch a bit of a poll and uh, just get a bit of feedback. I'll just launch that. And while, while that poll is being, um, while you're looking at that poll. Hopefully that sort of works. I can see people. I'll just um, highlight something that um, Sally asked me to highlight um, in particular. Uh, just everyone realises that, um, and your leaders are certainly conscious of the fact that from a well-being point of view, some people are struggling more than others. And uh, if this is you, remember you have an, an employee assistant program the details for that are, can be found on your staff intranet page. So um, the results are now in. I might just uh, push it up on the screen. I'll end the polling. Thank you for that. Most people are saying they're more productive, some less and a few the same. But generally speaking, um, people are thinking they're more productive. And, and in fact, um, that's my experience. I think uh, that in fact, I got interviewed just yesterday with a little podcast or the other day with a podcast. And uh, I actually made that point that I think generally people are more productive. And, um, and I think it has something to do with, you know, travel uh, and, and a range of other things, of course. But there are certainly some upsides and downsides. So some of the, um, down, the upsides might be less travel, more flexibility. You can see more of your family. There's definitely been a technology uplift that's huge, that technology uplift, which I think will see us well into the future. But then of course, there's been some downsides. It, it's harder to switch off. Interestingly, we're working longer, about 10% longer. Microsoft just recently did a survey on this of their people and they said about 10%. More meetings, it's, it's harder to collaborate. We don't have those chance encounters in the office that we can, um, we can just, uh, you know, speak to someone and, and of course, less socialization. Although where you see that as an upside or a downside might depend a little bit on your personality, of course. Uh, we were on a Zoom call just the other day with um, some friends and uh, when the six weeks, current six weeks isolation was announced and just in my ear, my wife just sitting alongside me just said, yes. So she's the introvert. She thought this was a good thing. Um, as an extrovert, I, I found that a little, little bit disheartening. So some of the challenges that we face working from home, um, getting set up to be productive. I think most of us have probably overcome that now, although I wanna suggest just a few little things for you. Uh, winning the self-discipline battle. Definitely wanna cover that. Staying focused on task, just dealing with distract, distractions, sorry, and, and perhaps interruptions, that the interruptions may be more like children and, and partners. Um, the work-life boundary challenge uh, is a big issue. Getting Zoomed or teamed out and lack of uh, human interaction, obviously. And just the, as I said earlier, the ability to collaborate uh, less effectively. 
So these are some of the challenges. Uh, we'll just now, what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna cover all these, but I wanna cover uh, what I consider some of the main ones. And um, here's what I wanna cover anyway. This some, some just some tips for being more productive, particularly just going paperless. I wanted to chat, chat about that. Uh, to-do lists and planning, internal conversations in teams and maybe not email, that would be an interesting one. Just winning the self-discipline battle, strategies to stay focused, dealing with distractions and then combating um, Zoom or Teams fatigue. So, as I said, most people have probably um, mastered most of this now, however, um, I just want to suggest a few things. I wrote an article on this a little while ago. And uh, so for me, there's still a few things I think we could do um, maybe better. So firstly, get set up somewhere where you can call work. And I, I've put work in, in inverted commas for a reason. Um, and it's, it's because uh, ideally, of course, you'd, you'd get away from noise and, and perhaps a separate room with a door. But of course, everyone's situation is quite different and uh, you can't always have a, sep a spare room you might be up in the bedroom and the kitchen um, so but for me I think somewhere where you call work is important and I'm saying this because um, uh, my, my children have now left home they've flown to Cooper we've got six grandchildren now and when the grandkids come around uh, when we're babysitting uh, and, and my wife has to take the credit for this she basically says pa has to go to work now i do come into another room but that doesn't stop our little four-year-old um ever ready battery um grandson just barging into the room and which he did a few times uh, but then when nanny started uh, saying well pa's at work now he's now respected that boundary and even yesterday i was running some training the door just opened slightly i can just see it from here and then closed again i thought oh that's probably uh, nathaniel a few minutes later, it opened quietly and he just trotted in, went to the toilet and went out again. Um, and they will often stick their head in and just say, oh, um, Pa, have you finished work now? And um, I'll either give them a yes or a no. So if you don't have that luxury uh, of another room, then perhaps, you know, you can think about this is my place where I call work. And there's other reasons for that too, not just for grandkids, of course. It means you get into the work zone. So um, so maybe there's, there's something there. And of course, um, you may also find that um, you need some a headset or whatever to maybe something like this noise cancelling headphones might be in, might be the go. So another thing that for me I big big fan of is using multiple screens. So here's a picture of my office I took a couple of months ago um, when I really started to work from here exclusively, um, and you can see I use three screens or four if you count the fly screen um, towards the front door, uh, but this for me, the three screens um, have been uh, a bit of an eye opener. Um, I set up um, you know, two screens, but I make use of that laptop screen, the third screen. And that's what I encourage you to do. Use that third screen. I usually use it as it is shown in this picture to show my OneNote. I've got OneNote open and I'll be taking my notes in there that I need to take. Uh, or sometimes I have my, my calendar open as well. Uh, if you're not sure how to do that, most people have probably got this, but um, you know, there's different ways to, to do it. Um, and if all else fails, call IT. Uh, but the thing that uh, I found once I connected all mine up is just, just understanding this one little thing. And it's, it's pretty simple to do, but if you sort of right click on your desktop and choose your display and then configure your displays in this sort of um, outfit, which is what I have at the moment, uh, and then it works pretty seamlessly. You can scroll up and down with your mouse, move move documents, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, just you can come back and have a look at this later. And if you've got any questions, feel free to email them through. But I think that's a pretty simple one, but making use of that third screen. In, in fact, just only two weeks ago, I was working with someone who really didn't want to use multiple screens. And, um, but, she had a go and um, yeah, love, thanks Catherine, I love that. By the way, put things in the chat if you want. Um, that really helps me just know that I'm, you know, so connecting right, but yeah, I, I couldn't do without two screens and in fact, three. 
And the other thing that I sometimes do, and if you only got the, you know, the luxury of one screen, you might try splitting your screen. And this is uh, something I've been using, even sometimes when I'm doing this, I'll split one of these screens. I've got two 24 inch monitors here and um, I will, uh, I'll split my screen. And I'm not sure if you know how to split your screen. Uh, some people do and some people don't, uh, but here's how you do it. Um, basically left click and hold on a window, any one of these and drag it to the end of the screen until it snaps into place. That's the easiest way to do it. Just left click, drag, it'll snap into place. It'll then open up all your other open wind or windows and you just choose one of those and then this will come up. You'll end up with two screens. The other way to do it is to use your windows arrow key. So you just highlight whichever window you want, use your windows arrow key left or right and it'll, you'll end up with the same result. Uh, yes, thanks, missing a second screen. Um, well, maybe split screens, um, Andrew, are, are the way to go. I have at, at, in times used my, um, uh, particularly when I'm traveling, used a television screen uh, and split that screen when I'm particularly in hotels. Uh, another little thing, um, just a quick tip here. <clears throat> if you're going, excuse me, without a laser printer, um, this is one thing that I've just been aware of. Um, and certainly been a limitation for some people. Uh, I'm not sure how you cope with that. Obviously at work, we have the big printers, but at, at home we might have a printer of course, but it won't be such a big printer. And only just recently I, um, I was running some OneNote training for another council and uh, one of the, the planners um, uh, just basically just said, oh, could I use this for my plans to print plans? And, and the answer was yes. So. If you, um, you know, I try not to print to paper. I do occasionally, but I try and avoid it if I can. So, um, but I, what I do is I print to OneNote instead. And that's what um, my planner friend, basically I suggested print into OneNote. And she was able to take a laptop then on site with quite big plans. <clears throat> um, and so um, print to OneNote. Uh, there's a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, you can print, I'm not sure who uses OneNote. Uh, if you do use OneNote, just pop some note in the chat. I know I've done some OneNote training at um, Mornington in the past, but if you, um, but not everyone's using it. Yes, thanks Sally. Uh, I just think OneNote is a game changer and it's actually become, I think even more important just working from home. So uh, here's the first way to do it. You can just print any document to OneNote. So open up a document. I've just opened up a little article here and you can write all over the page exactly. And then go to file, print, and actually you can print into OneNote. Yes, thanks Fletcher. I have quite a few OneNote books as well. So I'm not sure if you've tried this before, but print into OneNote. What it actually then says is it asks you to print and where in OneNote you want it. You just choose OneNote, choose the page, and it'll print in. Uh, it, basically, this is a multi-page document, um, so it prints, and I'll show you this in just a moment, another way this works. You can also print emails to OneNote, uh, and that's something that I've been um, doing just for preparation, particularly if I'm preparing for a meeting, I want a few emails in a document. I um, will basically uh, open an email, choose OneNote, so I've tried to do a screenshot here, so open an email. Up in the ribbon, you'll see there's a OneNote uh, icon, you choose OneNote from the ribbon, and then you've got to choose where in OneNote, which section that is in OneNote you want it to print to, and it will basically then print out that email. So if there's information for a meeting that you're looking for, that's another little handy option. Yes, and another way to do this is to drag and drop. So you could, if you're using multiple screens, just drag that email and drop it, um, and you get the same result. So I just, there's always multiple ways to do these things. Uh, so the other thing you can do is from inside OneNote print, um, print anything basically. So do a file printout, what they call. So if I'm just going back to my same article here, you can open OneNote, you, you go to the insert menu and, and then insert a file printout. And this is one I use mostly all the time because I'm in OneNote. Um, so, um, you then choose the document. So I just did a quick little video on this, uh, which I'll just, there's no sound to it, but I'll just talk through it. Um, just hit the play button. 
So um, here's what we have. I'm in OneNote, just in my demo OneNote page. So um, I'll go across first and open up a page, a new page perhaps, then go to the insert menu, file printout, which is just under that. And then you choose what article or what um, you want to print. So I've chosen the same one and it'll, you'll see it'll open up once you hit insert, it'll open up the document, in this case a PDF, but then it prints into the into OneNote um, and it basically just um, pops it into OneNote for you, including a link. So that's actually a link to the article, but it's also printing it out. So a useful way to go paperless. Um, another thing that, um, that I try to do is I've converted paperwork to digital copy. And there are a number of ways to do this. Again, of course, you can use a scanner on your printer or, or perhaps uh, on your phone. And that's probably my preferred option um, is to just use my phone. And, and OfficeNet, yes, thanks, Fletch. Don't remember if I suggested that one time or you just did it yourself. But, um, but Office Lens for me is a, is a game changer. You should try that. It, it's a Microsoft product. I haven't got time to go into it in great detail, but it's pretty um, intuitive. Uh, you basically, you've got to get it for your iPhone or your Android device. Um, you just sign in. There's a little sign in up. In fact, as you go in, it asks you to sign in. So you sign into your Microsoft account, which you'd use your work account if you're going to use it for work. Uh, and then you just start scanning documents, whiteboards, business cards, receipts, moving everything into um, OneNote. I've actually created, you can actually create a separate section for Office Lens or you can do what I did and I just created another notebook just for all my office lens stuff and scanning. So that's office lens. Glad to see a few people are actually using it. Uh, so I just want to pause really quickly. Sally asked me earlier, um, do we want to um, use this, use the mic? It might just be easy to ask the questions on, um, on here, uh, on the chat that is, as I'm looking at it. So if you've got any questions on that, uh, throw them into the chat. Otherwise, we'll just move on. I certainly suggest, um, I think paperless is, and I said it in my introduction, I think this is just this whole isolation thing, or not isolation thing, but the whole COVID thing has just amped up our, um, our technology or need to use the technology. And, uh, and we luckily we have it. Okay. So some great um, just comments coming through. Not so many questions, so we'll just move on. I'm going to launch another poll. Um, and uh, I'm going to go to another poll. I just want to know, so I'll launch this poll while it's happening. Um, I want to know what your preferred method of to-do lists is. So using your a paper list, perhaps, just keeping information in your head, Outlook tasks, Microsoft to do, Microsoft OneNote, or maybe other. Um, what is your preferred to, to do list? I'm curious on this. I'm going to um, just move it up here so you can see what's happening. Seems overwhelmingly that um, uh, people using paper, uh, and I'm not surprised about that. Papers. Um, Sticky notes on one of your screens. So um, yeah, I'm not surprised. Paper is obviously um, uh, a, a, an easy option. I just think there are better ways, electronic ways to do this. And um, oh, base camp, but there's a few I haven't heard of. So I did say others. Um, yeah. So um, and so Laura uses a spreadsheet. Lots of different options there. Uh, in fact, the task list in Outlook is always like a spreadsheet. Uh, so um, I'll end the polling there. That's enough information, but thank you for that. Uh, I want to just suggest a few things on to-do lists, some software-based things, but also um, just a few suggestions. Definitely create a to-do list. I, I know it's not too many people are just using their head, but I definitely would suggest create a to-do list every day. Um, it's important to know what you, what's important, what you have to do. Um, and uh, I, could tell a few stories about this, but I've keep coming across people who don't actively create a to-do list. And um, there are downsides when you don't do that. 
So a daily to-do list for me is really important. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, obviously, most people are using a paper list. But for me, I tend to use a combination of Outlook tasks, OneNote, and to-do. And so I just want to give you some other options. Those people um, that have worked me, with me in the past will know that I'm a um, big fan of the Outlook tasks. And this is just a snapshot when I was um, working on it yesterday, I think. And uh, here's my tasks for yesterday. So what I like about Outlook tasks is very similar to a spreadsheet. That person who mentioned that, that you can actually develop columns or have your own columns and customize your columns. Uh, you can even, I've got a column here for time um, and then you can group them. There's colors. There's a whole bunch of things you can do. So I really encourage you to have a look at Outlook tasks in the, here I've, on my website, I've actually got a little um, uh, article I wrote about this, how to configure your um, to-do list, a little simpler than this, but to get dates and group by dates. So um, you might want to have a look at that at another, another time. Um, but definitely, um, I'm not sure if the link will work on a video, but you'll be able to, to copy it. Or just jump into my, um, onto my website and do a search. The other thing that I do use is Microsoft To Do, and this is a, a little known um, Microsoft product, but it's becoming increasingly popular. The good thing about, so this is the, my task list again, um, yesterday when I took it. So the same information, my same tasks, slightly differently um, configured in To Do. Uh, I prefer my Outlook task list in that sense, but it's still, there are different ways you can view it. You can view by planned or assigned, flagged email. You can still view flagged emails, all this sort of stuff. And you can have different lists, but you can do an Outlook as well. Um, but it's still a, a very handy way of taking a list. How I tend to use it is enter tasks in Microsoft to do, and then, uh, and then see them and alter them in my, um, my Outlook task list. And of course, you would be not surprised, um, Fletch, to hear me say this, but Microsoft OneNote also is a, a great to-do list. And uh, here's just, I just did a screenshot of little thing I'm working on at the moment. And um, I'm using it to take some notes. I actually copied this straight out of an email, just dropped it in. So this is me working on a little event that's coming up, but I created a little to-do list task in there. So in, out, in OneNote, you can create little task or call them to do tags. And uh, I just needed a to do tag on the first three, the rest of it already responded to. But, and importantly too, and um, you might remember those that have done the OneNote training, you can actually send um, by using this to do tag an Outlook task to do tag, you can send things straight to uh, OneNote, sorry, straight to Outlook, your Outlook tasks. So this is the way I can coordinate all my tasks. I might input them from OneNote, I might input them from To Do, but they all sit in my Outlook tasks. So, which is essentially what I'm trying to say here, one list to rule them all. A um, little bit of a play on Lord of the Rings, obviously, but um, you wanna be able to find all your to-dos in one place, uh, which is one of the reasons I didn't end up going with OneNote. I've got notes all over in OneNote, but I want them all congregating in my task list. And uh, so if you can, whether whichever way you go, have, have one list that rules all other lists. And this you can keep them quite separate. I mean, I do have a separate Bunnings list, all right? Um, so uh, it's quite okay if you can keep them really separate, uh, then it's, that's fine. But one system at least. Um, and prioritize your list, of course. So keep, keep your list prioritized. Um, and just had a quick question as I, I from, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. Um, is that Tan, Tan Tanasi? I'm not sure. Um, but the question is, do you use OneNote or do you use OneNote 218? Or it's actually 216. I use OneNote 216, not the Windows 10 version. Because the Outlook tasks that I just showed you, you doesn't, is not available on the Windows 10 version. I hope that answers the question. Um, so uh, breaking down complex tasks um, is, is an, my next step. And again, electronically, I think this is actually quite easy. I just got an example here of, of what you might do. 
in in Microsoft To Do. Um, you can break a task down. In fact, in To Do, which you can't necessarily do in Outlook tasks as easily, uh, you can actually ap apply steps or add steps in Microsoft To Do. Microsoft To Do, by the way, you can download. It's just like downloading um, Office Lens, download to your phone, or you can use it online, or even there's a, a program. Um, and but this is the steps. I like the steps in To Do, but this this has actually come from um, OneNote for me. So they all talk to each other, which is because they're all Microsoft products. So. And my last comment on this is really um, don't rely on your memory. And uh, I noticed not, not too many where two people were doing that. Um, but if you're, um, if you're guilty of perhaps waking up in the middle of the night, I probably should have created a poll on this and suddenly thinking of something that you haven't done um, or need to do, then um, you, you could be suffering from what's called the Zaganik effect, which was developed by this lady here, Bloomer Zaganik, in, in about the 1920s. And um, she discovered that basically, if you don't write things down, your unconscious mind will continually nag you until they're done. And so, uh, or put another way, um, your subconscious mind will never let you forget what your conscious mind has decided to do. So that moment you have a thought, oh, I need to ring this person or do that. If you think I'll just remember later, chances are as you get flooded with more information that you won't, or you will remember later, but that, that most inappropriate time. So that's the importance of writing a to-do list, just writing things down, making a list. And uh, um, I, I did some coaching work um, with a, a person in Melbourne a couple of years ago, but it, it sticks in my mind because it was quite, in our, quite a, amazing. In our first session, um, I suggested a number of things. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. I, <clears throat> yes, so some people, um, people can probably see what Catherine's written here, but yes, so people leave a, a note on the, the dead, uh, sorry, on the bed, uh, bedside table, um, you know, pen and paper or whatever, or their phone. But actually, really write it down the moment you think of it, really. That's, that's, the, that's the key. All right. So write things down, make the list. Um, and as I said, so my friend that I was working with, my first session, I, I might be just chatting and I was getting to know some of his issues. And I didn't really take notice of the fact that he didn't write anything down. So, um, and I left him some things to do. So our next session, um, I started to follow up and did you do this? And, oh, no, no, I didn't do that. What about this? No, 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 I didn't have a chance to get around to that. And suddenly I realised that he didn't have a pen and paper with him. And I thought, hmm, I wonder how he's remembering things. And so I just asked him, so how is it, um, we'll call him Peter, how is it, Peter, that you remember things? And, uh, and Peter's response was, oh, I, I don't forget anything. I'm always remembering things. And I knew that wasn't true because he had forgotten a lot of stuff. And I said, well, does, when you say you're always remembering things, does that mean you sometimes wake up in the middle of the night? And he said, oh yeah, this happens constantly. I'm always thinking of stuff. And so I then talked to him about the Zaganik effect. And I think he had a similar response to what Catherine had. He just, it was an eye opener for him. He then just started to grab his pen and paper and started making lists. So a simple thing, but um, really powerful. So, sorry, just jumping ahead. So, um, so going along with this, uh, I want to just talk to you about then the importance of using your to-do list and then creating a plan from your to-do list. And I use, like most of us would probably do our Outlook calendar. It's interesting that we've transitioned easily from a paper diary, or maybe not so easily, but a paper diary to our Outlook calendar. And that's because of course our Outlook calendar we have to use. And we, we've got to put meetings in there. So my point is then why not use it to um, block out time for tasks? And I have a saying I've been using for some time. Don't just plan where you need to be, but also start planning what you need to do. So here's a bit of a, just a screenshot of my calendar. Um, yes, um, thanks, Catherine. I've got that. <laughs> Thank you. That's good clarification. Um, so 
uh, you can see what I've done here. I've got sort of meetings and coaching appointments, but in, a run, in amongst that, I've actually blocked out time to do preparation or perhaps for some other important things um, and, and maybe to work on things. So really, uh, and, and actually I haven't shown you this, but if you've got your task list, you can actually drag and drop into your calendar from your task list. Uh, so just drop things in and, um, and pop them into your task list when you need to do them. So that for me has been a, a game changer over many years. And one thing I suggest that we all should get in the habit of doing allocating time for important tasks in amongst our phone calls and meetings. And for, for many years, I've used this term, one life, one diary, uh, putting work and personal all together. And it's fascinating about what's happening now, of course, it, it, that work and life have become, work and home have almost become the same or synonymous. And so um, I think even now, um, even now it's important to actually start popping, um, popping uh, personal things in amongst the work things we have to do. And I just highlighted something here. Our grandkids were over this day and um, I had to, I had a fair bit of work on <clears throat> and uh, see that question. I'll just come back to that in a moment. Um, and uh, so I wanted to spend some time with my grandson uh, because I had a, a bit of a presentation that I had to, to prepare for. Uh, but uh, I block that time out and, and that's what I encourage you to do. Just block time out for personal stuff as well. And then my last suggestion here is, is live by your calendar. So I open my calendar often in another window um, and I'm going to just show you how to do that in a moment, but I've had a question about colors. Um, so there are two ways to do colors. You can um, use categories. Most people I think tend to use categories for formatting uh, colors. Uh, I, that's the simplest way to do it. Just use color categories. You can do it automatically through conditional formatting. That's a little bit more complicated, but, um, but the easiest thing to do is probably just create some categories for different styles of work. I still do that even though I do automate some colors. I hope that answers the question. So opening up your calendar, another window, call it live by your calendar. It's pretty easy to do. In fact, you can do this on any of these. And this is again, where multiple screens come in really handy. Just right click on any one of your um, navigation buttons, right click on those and then open a new window and then drag that window off to another screen. So this is how I tend to do it all the time. I tend to drag it down to my laptop screen, uh, but, it's, but either way, it'll, um, it works a treat. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, so just right click, open up. You can do this with your calendar. You can do it with your to-do list. You probably don't want to worry about uh, people, but um, you can even do it with tasks, uh, sorry, with notes if you want as well. Or even the other day I opened up two emails. So you can actually right click and open up two versions of anything here if you have to work on stuff together. So practice that. We'll have a bit of a play um, and see how you go with that. And I will just, just pause and see if there are any other questions. Um, I did answer that one. Just a few people jumping into the meeting. Yeah, so the, it's through automatic formatting, the automatic color. It's called, or it used to be called automatic formatting, or auto formatting. It's now called conditional formatting. Um, if you, if you want to email me, I'll actually, I'm happy to show you how, how it's done. I don't think I've got anything on my website on that one. Okay, so um, uh, yes, Sally, thank you. Uh, I have the calendar open at the first view and I actually didn't say that, um, but you should, um, yeah, I should have put it in here. I, something I do as well, I change my default settings so that in Outlook, my calendar opens up first. So your default open is your inbox. Um, but actually if you go to uh, file options and advanced, you might want to write this down, file, options in Outlook and advanced and scroll across straight away to um, uh, where it says, um, you yeah, know, open in this window and you'll see, well, it's startup. I think it says startup and then basically choose your browse and choose your calendar to start up. So um, yeah, so sorry, I probably should have put that in here. I didn't, 
can think, but that's a great suggestion. Thanks, Sally. Okay. Uh, just a little bit on um, Microsoft Teams. Now, I, I, I know that most of us um, are using Teams. Yeah, thank you, Shane. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah, just focus on what you have to do. So Microsoft Teams, this has been a fascinating um, shift. Obviously, everybody's using Teams now. Uh, and um, I made a bit of a joke the other day that um, the thing with Teams is it's become... Um, uh, it's it's just just everyone's just had to learn it. All right, if you had to develop a change management program for moving towards a program like Microsoft Teams to do video chats and and whatnot, um, you would have d developed a change management process around that. If there's any change managers on the on the call, but all we've done with Teams is go here it is, just start using it. All right, for for many organisations, and um, so there's a lot in Teams. But all I just want to focus on is conversations versus email conversations, all right? So conversations in Teams versus conversations in email. And um, there's a number of ways to do this, but if you think about conversations in emails, they can be quite messy. Uh, they're very hard to track because they come in at various times. So you might send an email and you get um, messages coming back days later, uh, sometimes weeks later. So it's quite inefficient. It takes a lot of time to track and follow those responses. Um, and there's been some research done on this, how stressful it is as well at the same time. Of course, if you convert, if you do conversations in teams, provided everyone follows the conversation trail, it's actually tighter and easier to track. The conversation stays in order. It stays in context. And as a result, it's quite less stressful. And, um, and that's certainly what I'm finding. So I'm trying to move a lot of internal conversations. You can't necessarily do it with externals too well, but internal conversations to, um, to, to Microsoft Teams. Um, might come back to that, Roz. It's a good question. Um, so here's, here's a, just a... a screenshot of my team's page all right so um it it uh, you know so i'm not going to go through this in great detail but i just want to focus on this one team that i've got it's just myself and one other person so it's fairly simple um but you know this person's helped me with some um blog wording and and whatever but if you just think about this these are all the different conversations that we've got going on um and there's five replies in his Five replies in this. All right. So I'm just going to expand this in another screenshot. So here's the conversation. So David's contacted me on the 2nd of the 7th at 8.51. I did see it pretty quickly. Are we due for another blog post? Um, yeah, I've just responded. A um, bit of an emoticon, which you can do anyway. But, but then he's come back fairly quickly. Okay. I've come back to him quickly. But then there's been a delay. I've then gone back to him a couple of weeks later or nearly two weeks later uh, and then followed up again. Um, and then there's a, a little bit more going on after that. So um, it, it, it started happening, but imagine this conversation in email, and I could, probably could have picked another one with more stuff, but in an email, this is actually going to be difficult to track because there'll be other emails coming in. And so this for me is, um, is where I think Microsoft Teams has a, a big role to play in internal emails. Though I was asked a question um, about can this be completed with external consultants? Um, and yes, it can. So, but the, you have to add that person as a guest. So that might be an IT thing you have to um, do uh, because I'm running my own business. I can add guests and I know I've been added as a guest in other council teams and we do the same thing. So um, uh, I'm, I'm in a guest of two or three other councils uh, for different programs that I'm working with them on. So the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, the question that, um, uh, that Roz asked, which is an interesting one, and I've been asked this before, um, where something deserves to be filed as a corporate record, is it always done by email, not by teams? And that's, people are still getting their head around that, Roz. I haven't got an easy answer for you. Uh, if in this case, I wouldn't have thought this is a corporate record as such that you would have to save, it'll still be within teams. 
but let's say I did attach a document, um, then I'd probably have to drop that into uh, my my corporate document folder. Um, but I think for general conversations, I think the answer would be no, but uh, I'm, again, I can't really speak for every organisation how they want to deal with it, but I, I know I've been asked this one before. And if anyone's got any comments on that, it will capture video call logs provided you set up the meeting within Teams. All right, so with, when I say within Teams, within the calendar in Teams. So if you set it up within Outlook, it won't capture it. But if you set it up within the channel, um, then it will capture that. Yeah, and, and Laura's a good question. If people need to answer urgently, I, this is, this, I'm just challenging you to think about it differently here um, because I just find uh, that this sort of conversation can last a couple of weeks, but it stays tight. It could collapse it or expand it. So maybe just something to consider but I've certainly, um, uh, I, I know I've worked with a few councils on this and there's um, one particular council or team in, in a council in Melbourne um, found this very valuable just for internal stuff. Okay. Um, so I just want to, I know that, you know, when I thought about putting teams in, I thought, oh, teams are so big. Um, I wasn't sure how far to go with it, but um, I thought I'd just focus on one aspect of Teams. There are a lot of different things we could do. So, but I do want to just spend a bit of time um, just talking about winning the self-discipline battle. Yes, you can PDF print that conversation. So, um, yes, you can. You can print print to PDF, print it anywhere you like, actually. So, um, yeah. So, winning the self-discipline battle. We all love freedom, of course, but... Um, we, need, we do need to win that self-discipline battle, especially at home. I think it's actually become a little bit more challenging. In that, I think at work, you're conscious that other people are around, around you, of course. And um, so there's, you seem to think you, you don't really want to sort of slack off too much. Um, but, but at home, of course, you don't have that same sort of pressure. And uh, so you've got a lot of autonomy, but you know, with that becomes some issues. So some of the suggestions... Um, that I might make here. And uh, I just have realised that um, when I did my screen share, I forgot to click one little button, um, which is a bit of a shame because I had a little video I wanted to show you. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, it's my little grandson. Um, I'll just have to talk you through this, unfortunately. But he's, um, my daughter gives him a little cookie and then walks out of the room. Apparently, this is a thing, all right? And... Uh, if I play it, you won't hear the sound, unfortunately, because I've got to click a little button. Uh, and, um, but it's quite cute. He actually doesn't eat the cookie, which I think I might have eaten the cookie. Uh, he just sits there and waits for about two minutes. She didn't, she said five, but she only just lasted a minute. And, um, and then came back in and, and then he ate the cookie. So um, that was going to be a nice little intro, but oh, I can hear it in my ears, but you won't hear it. So, a few suggestions for um, just winning that self-discipline battle. Certainly, I think developing a routine that works for you, for you and your situation. Um, you you want to be, um, I think, flexible with this. But at work, we naturally get into a routine. We've got to, we've got travel. We've got we can prepare all that sort of stuff. We get into some sort of routine. But at home, it's actually harder to develop that routine because there's so many distractions. So um, one of the things that I like to do is, is determine my start time the night before. So this feeds into opening up your calendar really too, first thing. So try and determine what your first task will be. So in my calendar, certainly I know what, what's the first thing I want to work on. Now, clearly, if it's something like you know this today, then it's all taken care of. You just work on your presentation or get ready for it. But... If it's uh, something that I just have to work on, I still want that shown in my task list so I'm more productive first up. And then importantly, and this sort of feeds into what I was saying in my introduction about work-life balance, I try and plan an activity at the end of the day, something that's going to get me out of the house. Always did this for work, um, but now, of course, it's a little harder because it's harder to get out, so we, uh, we're really thinking about um, maybe visiting the lounge room or something. Um, but seriously, getting out for a walk, we can still do that. Um, 
So some non-work activity at the end of the day, I think is really important. And set yourself some mini goals to achieve. So this is, again, I'm using a, a gin and tonic perhaps, Sally, yes. Um, why not? Um, I was going to say, well, for me, my mini goal to achieve, I actually reward myself. So I'm clear on what I want. I try and be clear on what I want to work on. Um, it's written down already. Uh, if it's not, I'll write it down, but it's, usually it is. Um, but I do reward myself. And it's not usually a G&T. And it's not even M&Ms. Uh, it's often for me, it's a coffee. Um, so, uh, but maybe not at the end of the day. So, uh, yeah, so I think just having a clear, a few clear goals, um, is important to keep your, uh, to win that self-discipline battle. And then of course, once you've got that, you then have to deal with, um, distractions. And, uh, there are two types of distractions for us, really, um, sensory type distractions, which happen around us or emotional distractions, which more happen. This is the Daniel Goleman thing. So um, both of these are, are worth, worth looking at. I'll, I'll just focus first on the sensory distractions, really. Uh, I think if you've got the luxury of closing the door, obviously you will, um, but you maybe can't always necessarily do that. Noise cancelling headphones, I mentioned that earlier, or just even letting people know you have to go focus for a time. Um, so I do this with my, uh, certainly with my grandkids, let them know I'm coming in here to do a bit of work and I'll be out again. This just happened as recently as yesterday. Another little thing, which, <clears throat> which I would, um, thanks Laura, I'm going to get to that actually. Well done. I turn off your email alert. So really quickly, I don't think you need to be reminded every time an email hits your inbox. Um, so I would suggest turning off your email alert. Those who have done work with me before realize I'm a big fan of just turning off this alert. Um, and so, um, yeah, here's how you do it. File options, mail, message arrival, turn off all the devices. You should not know when an email hits your inbox. I, in my opinion, I think by exception you can do it, but um, really I, I do on my mobile as well. So I'll get to the mobile in a moment. I do this on, on all my devices actually. So um, this is just some feedback I got from a, a group I work or so, yeah, from a person I work with. I didn't realize how much of a distraction the pop-ups were. And, and now when I check my inbox, I'm able to dedicate time to processing emails rather than have a quick pointless preview. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great way of staying focused. And I do turn off notifications on all my devices, including my mobile for even emails. Yes. Uh, but also social media uh, messages as well. And um, so I, I, I basically, yeah, big difference. Thanks Shane. Big. Um, yeah. It's, it's not hard to do, but it's fiddly. And, and uh, so I just, I, I want to get control of my devices. I turn off all my notifications fascinatingly enough. And this is why it works so well. The average person apparently checks their mobile phone more than 80 times a day. And sometimes some people up to 300 times a day. And if you think about that, that's going to cause you to either multitask um, or um, another, there's another term I would use too, but it's a huge distraction. So um, thank you, Gemma. So emotional distractions, just a little bit on this. I'm probably um, the sort of person I am, I'm more um, focused on sort of practical um, applications, but I do recognize that, um, you know, the emotional distractions are quite powerful and probably even more so as we're working from home. Um, and so some of these are really, this one I do do, uh, if I feeling overwhelmed, try and do a brain, um, brain dump. Right. So just get, if I, particularly if I'm going to start something, just get rid of all those thoughts in my head. So they might be to do's or just ideas or whatever I'm working on. Um, quiet hours. Yes, Stuart, indeed. Practice mindfulness, um, meditation, something like that um, is really useful and probably really good for our mental health at the moment, but really useful to, to do that. Uh, and that's, yeah, something for me, prayer is for me, but whatever it is for you, um, and the other thing I would suggest is as soon as you have an idea, write it down. 
So I think Catherine was alluding to this sort of stuff, just write things down, write your ideas down, get them out of your head, try not to be thinking about too much. Uh, so um, yeah, this is coming back to um, the Zaganic effect, I guess. And just a few strategies to improve your focus. And this is where I'm gonna actually talk about Pomodoro, funnily enough, um, so Laura, I think it was. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Pomodoro. It's, it's basically using focused, or focused blocks of time to get things done. Um, Outlook does in fact have a focus button, you're right. Uh, so Pomodoro um, was developed by Francesco Cirello, but it, essentially what it is is this. So it's, it is based on a timer. It's decide upon the task to be completed, set a timer. You generally set it for 25 minutes or you can set it for whatever you like, but that's what they suggest. Work on the task, stop when the timer sounds, take a bit of a break, mental break, do something different, and then go back to step one or two. If you haven't finished it, obviously you'll start back here. If you've started, finished it, you start back at, at one. So um, I, I'm a big fan of Pomodoro as well, but I didn't want, actually want to do a timer. So what I've developed, and this will, I'll go through this quickly, but it is on my website and um, I'll, I'll put a link, I'll give a link to Sally to put out um, when she posts the video. Uh, I call it my Priodoro, all right? So um, I'm basically using Outlook reminders as my timer. So I decide upon the task to, that I need to complete. I block out time my calendar, so I normally do that anyway. Um, and then I get a 15 minute reminder. We all have that standard 15 minute reminder, which you can change, but I get it 15 minutes before. So I then, when I get the reminder to start this task, I snooze it till the start time. But that, that allows me to mentally prepare. I then, and this is an important one, I then work in emails, offline in emails in Outlook. So I, I actually stop emails coming in. And this has been a bit of a game changer for me personally. I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. I start my task, I work for 30 or 45, I set that reminder really, I snooze the reminder for 30 or 45 minutes, even though I've blocked out an hour. I don't dismiss it, so I'm actively using the, the, the timer or the, the, um, uh, the reminder. I then, when I get that reminder coming up 45 minutes later, I might nearly be finished, I might snooze it for five or 10 or 15 minutes until it's done, and then I take a break before I commence my next task. And don't forget then you've got to change the Outlook settings back online. So, um, and then at that point you repeat, go back at the top, might be another task or same task again. So that's a, a way of using Pomodoro, using your Outlook reminders or Outlook calendar reminders in particular. Um, to work offline in Outlook uh, is this, button here. So you basically go to send and receive and then click work offline. Just remember, you have to come back and work online. It doesn't really, it's got a little cross, but it actually just, um, it doesn't really do much. So you just have to, you'll see it down in your um, taskbar that you're offline, but remember to work back online um, and then go. So um, I don't know if that sort of makes sense. Uh, it's, um, What's the difference between it? So I am going to just stop and ask questions here and because uh, I'm conscious of people are dropping off now, Sally. So um, uh, probably ready for a 10.30 meeting. Uh, so what's the difference between a brain dump and a brainstorm? Well, um, if you're doing it on your own, I guess it's a brain, a brain dump, all right? But um, if you're doing it with other people, it would be a brainstorm. But you could do your own brainstorm, of course, just, just write things up. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, technically this probably... Yeah, I would agree, Catherine's saying it's on one project. Well, a brain dump is just, you know, just getting thoughts out here onto paper. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's how I would, we might just finish it up at this. I was going to cover off one other thing. But um, in fact, if we did get to the end, I wasn't sure. I might have, I had a little bit just in reserve in case. But um, I hope that's been helpful. I know people have had to drop off. I've kept the recording going anyway. So those people that did drop off want to catch the questions they can. I don't know if anyone else has got questions, but hopefully that's been helpful. Feel free to, to connect with me on social media. 
and um, you know, particularly on LinkedIn, that's where I'm more active, I guess. And look at my blog site too. There's a lot of information there. Uh, so thank you. Um, and I apologize once again for only a hundred people. I had no idea about that. So I've learned something there. Uh, so Sally, I'll, I'll end the recording at this point.